All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Metabolic Mentor podcast. I'm your host, functional nutritionist, Vince Pitstick, and we have another great one for you today. As you know, the Mentor podcast is all about amazing transformations, transformations in life over disease, in athletics, and in entrepreneurship and business. And when we talk about transformations uh, today, this is probably one of the craziest transformations that we've probably had on the podcast IFBB Pro Megan Santa Barbara, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I, I if if a lot of my followers and, and listeners, uh, shameless plug, YouTube, please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. It really helps us. If you're not familiar with Megan, uh, you're in for you're in for a treat. Uh, a story of really like a hero's journey of overcoming uh, great, you know. You know, disease in her in her own life, essentially, to then become the top of a sport, and then to pivot for her own health, you know, and and then also, you know, what you've done in education and everything else. So, if you would, just a second, just kind of let people know a little bit about you. Yeah. So I am Megan Santa Barbara. I am an IFBB Figure Pro. I'm also a nutrition coach with Scooby Prep under Jason Theobald. That's and right. Shout out, Jason. Yeah, shout out. Yeah, happy right. birthday. The man. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. This will, this will come yeah. out later, but yeah, there's a happy but, belated yeah, for you. Belated. Yeah. Um, and I'm also a new ethics sponsored athlete, yeah, which is That's amazing. Right. Just all the shout outs. Newethics.com. Um, yeah. Newethics.com. Code MS15. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just recently graduated with my doctor of chiropractic, so I'm a new chiropractor in town. Yeah. So... A bunch of different things about so much. me. Yeah. You like, so for anybody that, you know, I love, you know, the one in 100 mission is to take people in the fitness, take the, the, the components, the discipline, the lifestyle of fitness and apply it to functional medicine and healing modalities. And you are kind of at the divergence of exactly the thing that I want to see in the future. You know, knowing nutrition, mm -hmm. getting other modalities of care, whether it's uh, physical therapy, chiropractic, I don't care what your other modality is, but having multiple tools on the tool yeah. belt to be able to help people with real problems. Mm -hmm. I think you realize too that like any one tool in and of itself is nice, mm -hmm. but it's not a it's not a well rounded answer, mm -hmm. right? And you are like the you know you 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 first you were certified by life, mm -hmm. you you overcome a lot, and we're going to talk about that. Then you. Then you you added the tool of nutrition and mindset and and you know recovery, mm -hmm. right? And then you added chiropractic. You see, you keep adding all these tools, mm -hmm. right? And that's what the Hybrid Health Summit. Another shout out. Way too many shameless plugs right up front. <laughs> all of them. HybridHealthSummit.net. Megan yes, will, be will be there. I will be there. That's right. <laughs> so that's what the call is for one in one hundred. Is like I don't care if you have no tools. Mm -hmm. Learn to be a mentor. Learn to be a coach. Yeah. Learn how to help your own life to be an example mm -hmm. for others. If you are a practitioner, add more tools. For sure. Add more utility. And you're the example of that. And congratulations because you just you. got the license, right? This week. This <laughs> <Yeah>. week. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> it took a little while, but yeah. It's a long you. process. I yeah. mean, how many years for you? Oh, my gosh. Uh, seven. Seven years. Seven and a half of yeah, school. Yeah, Putting in that work. But I mean, I feel like learning never stops. I mean, I'm still taking like online like module classes and things like that. Like you just yeah. truly can never know enough, you, I think. You so. got to stay humble, stay you student. Do, yeah, everything's yeah. changing. So you need yeah. to keep up with it for sure. 100%. Yeah. And you wouldn't realize this probably from from looking at her. Uh, she's, she's, I mean, done amazing things <laughs> and she looks great. But there was a time you didn't look so great because things had kind of gone a different direction. Yeah. And uh, so you kind of, what people might be surprised to know is you started with a pretty s severe eating disorder, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, probably anyone in the fitness space, they say 60 to 80% of people who will embark in a health coaching program mm -hmm. or fitness program at some point probably started with some disordered eating. And then some of the numbers out there, you know, up to 13% of people right now are dealing with some kind of, you know, bulimia, yeah. anorexia. Um, but there's so many people not self-reporting that the numbers are somewhere in the neighborhood of at least 20, 25% of women at some point. Right. And, but men, it's becoming really popular with sure. men too, which yeah. is really interesting. And your story is so inspiring. And so I like, when did it all, cause I saw some photos of you on, mm -hmm. on Instagram. If you don't mind producer for Keone, why don't you drop the before right here? Like, like, right, like, like, right. Can we do it here? Right there. Okay. <laughs> Little down. Right, right here. Okay. And, uh, and so can you just kind of take us back to the beginning? Cause I'm fascinated. Yeah. yeah. So 
my disordered eating, it, it originally began when I was about 14 years old. So I began dancing, mainly ballet, when I was three years old, and I continued that up until about 18. So, But when I was 14, that's when I became pretty passionate about it. I knew this is what I wanted to do with my life. I was that young girl that was like dreaming of dancing on the professional stage. Um, so I did become very obsessed with the sport. And I mean, it's a very physically demanding sport and it's physique driven, very similar to bodybuilding. Uh, and that's probably what drew me into bodybuilding. <laughs> so, so real quick, what yeah. the, what what style of dance? Is ballet. It ballet. Ballet. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's so. a wild different. Looking at the amazing physique you yeah. get now, and to think about ballet. I right? know that's awesome. Yeah, I love thank that. Yeah, yeah, ballet was definitely my biggest passion. That's all I. Everything I just thought about it all the time. I mean, it, it is like a full time sport that you're participating in. It was after school hours on the weekends. I was in the studio for eight hours a day, like rehearsal after rehearsal. So it is, it's very physically demanding. And, you know, that societal pressure around dance, you need to be or you need to be thin. Or that's what you think because you see the professional dancers and that's what you're looking up to and that's what you're aspiring to be. So, I mean, there's also like, there were some instructors throughout my time of dancing that would kind of put pressure on you to remain thin. So that was a huge deal. Um, and I did, I actually, it's funny now, but I was vegan for about five and a half years of that. Mm. And I thought I was vegan because I was trying to be healthy, but I knew it was more of control. And that's a big thing with disordered eating is, you want that sense of control in your life. And that's just basically what the eating disorder is all about. So that recipe right there, like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, like the strong obsession, yeah. right. To be someone that can be obsessed and focused, mm -hmm. like on one hand is a, a huge advantage mm -hmm. in sport and life. Yeah. But then we start getting afraid of the world mm -hmm. and we look to control things <clears throat> that we know we can control. Yeah. And, we'd start to get so obsessed with the control that that's when the the gift kind of becomes a curse and the programming kind of goes awry a little bit. And oh, like, yeah. you know, we get the wrong impressions about the world mm -hmm. and then we start leaning in too heavy, right? Yeah. And and then those behaviors and those patterns become obsessive. I, mm -hmm. I know that all too well. And that's, you know, I, I would say this, I mean, plant-based diets, mm -hmm. when you start getting to the polar extremes of any of them, not that they can't be helpful, mm -hmm. but that's where a lot of, the hidden eating disorders live. Yeah. They're yeah. hiding under the guise of, oh, I just really want to be healthy. I don't want to, you know, hurt animals or I, you know, not even just on that end. It's like, I just want to eat, you know, only protein and get away from plant toxins. So even yeah. if you're on that side, right, mm -hmm. I don't want to just single out the vegans. But unfortunately, the 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 vegan lifestyle and uh, it's, it lends itself to a lot of ED behavior and eating disorders, which is a sad thing because for some people, switching vegan for a short period of time or moving at least extremely plant-based can be really healthy. Yeah. But then it goes so bad mm -hmm. for so many. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think that those obsessive thoughts and that control, like my thinking went like straight black and white. I, if I wasn't perfect in my eyes, then I was a failure. So, and I mean... 14 years old, that's so young to be even thinking like that. So, I mean, quickly, my passion for dance, it started to dwindle, but I still pushed through. And I would say like 14 to 16 were my my big struggle years. That's when, I mean, my family, my friends noticed. Um, and that was extremely hard for me. I saw many therapists, psychiatrists. I went through an outpatient program. Um, probably one of the hardest things is when I was, I believe I was 15 at the time, I was hospitalized oh, wow. um, the week of Christmas. So just seeing myself, I, f I felt like a burden to my family, truly. Um, but what happened was I went to a therapist appointment or a psychiatrist appointment with my dad. He dropped me off. And the psychiatrist at the time had to go get him because we had to call an ambulance because I 
had a very low heart rate and very low blood pressure. So I was taken to the ER. And I mean, I always think like, you know, what was my turning point as to like to pull myself out of these trenches? And I don't think I had just one turning point, but I think a huge one that I can vividly see over and over again in my head is I ended up passing out at the ER and I just wake up and I see my dad and he's he gets emotional and I do too but um just seeing how scared he was that he could have lost his baby girl you know from yeah. something like this so I think that was a huge turning point for me so I did complete an outpatient program and I from about 16 to about 17 I felt pretty in control over the eating disorder which was great um because my parents they didn't know like should she continue dance but then they saw that I was improving and I ended up transferring and going away for college to University of North Carolina School of the Arts and I was going to major in classical ballet and I felt healthy and good going into it and my parents were all on board again but then quickly you know mm. I was finally on my own again and those thoughts just came back yeah. and I mean living with an eating disorder it's truly like living in a prison in your mind like you're held captive by these thoughts and you're gonna act on them that's why I think relapsing is so prevalent yeah um but that's when my eating disorder definitely returned when I was 18. Mm. Like, away from home, you get that control again. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's Yeah, it, because eating, you know, eating disorders is one of the most challenging ones mm -hmm. because <clears throat> you have to continue to do the thing mm -hmm. that you have a problem with, right? Yeah. Most recovery-based processes mm -hmm. are successful because of abstinence first. Yeah. And with food, that can be really challenging. Mm -hmm because they're already not eating enough. And then, you yeah. know, so the challenges with that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then we have to, some of the environments that are triggering, we have to put ourselves, we put ourselves back in those people, places and things, mm -hmm. right? In this case, the sport, yeah. that was kind of the triggering event, even if this, we can't blame the sport necessarily for the cause, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But it was the trigger. Yeah. And because sure. that's the trigger, it's how do you return to the thing that's the trigger and somehow stay mm -hmm. mentally well, okay. right? Yeah. And so, you know, I know for me, because I battled drug addiction, it's something that I've talked some about uh, on the podcast, but the, 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 you're right. There's a series of moments. There isn't this place where it's like, it does happen for some people, but sure as hell didn't happen for me where it was like, I had this one moment and that was it. Yeah, and I never did it again. Yeah. And you know what? God bless those people. Mm -hmm. My road had to be way more complicated than that. And it, the, but the, the moment where I realized I had to do something, the first moment, <laughs> that awareness moment was when like literally I got involved with the wrong people trying to go get drugs and they helped me up in the back. I got held by gunpoint for like eight hours in the back of my own car. Yeah. And I'm like, well, how did I get in this situation? And I'm like, well, I'm looking for drugs and yeah. this is how it, this is what happens. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, that was that like, okay, like there's something needs yeah. to happen, wake up. but that wasn't the, the end. Mm -hmm. That was the awareness point. Of course. Yeah. Right. And so, like, at your lowest weight, like, what did you get down to? Um, I believe, I mean, I'm, I'm five foot eight. I'm not a small, <laughs> petite woman. No. Um, but I, I believe I was about 105, 110. Yeah, for a five foot eight, if you were to put that into an average five, four female, that's probably 90 pounds. I was, yeah, I was very thin. 88. So, I mean, definitely the process of putting on weight was mentally tough for me. And I think that also continued with bodybuilding. It was hard to see myself putting on muscle and then dieting for a show. And then that off season, I mean, people struggle all the time off season, but it's definitely hard if you have that past of eating disorders. So. Yeah. So that translates to a coach today, right? So like, mm -hmm. let's keep going with your story a little yeah. bit, but I want to talk about, because now having that skill though, and understanding what that process is like trying to put on muscle mm -hmm. has got to be a great skill as a coach now, because yeah. you have to know even every, everybody's on a sliding scale of addiction. Mm -hmm. If anybody thinks they're not, they better be like Pope Francis or yeah. 
or you know a monk yeah. right <laughs> we live we live in a society you're born into an addicted society yeah. period and dot so you start an addict and then you've got to free yourself over the time mm -hmm. right it's just some of us become way more aware of it because yeah. we go through really hard shit really exactly. early yeah. like oh my life's on the line like i need to make a difference mm -hmm. you life's on the line i make mean, some people it's shopping netflix whatever and it's not a warning enough sign so they just go through a slow bleed the rest of their life yeah right for us it was very abrupt mm -hmm. and we had to deal with it and become aware of kind of the matrix yeah right mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> it i mean it definitely helps me as a coach having these personal experiences yeah. because now i can see like in their check-in like if i see something and it's like a red flag i know how to respond to it appropriately and how i can help them navigate those thoughts yeah. um because i think what people don't realize is you know orthorexia mm -hmm. trying to eat clean yeah, all, the time, all the time that's still disordered eating mm -hmm. and i'm not one to bash the diet industry because i think that's a huge thing right now on social media is just bashing how there's like always like the talk about dieting and yes, things like yeah. that. But I mean, I think there is definitely a way to go about dieting in a healthy way. Well, when people don't have the solution, because everyone wants the answer to be clean, it's either yes or no. Yeah. You're either a piece Wider of shit yeah. or you're Mother Teresa. Yeah. And, and, there, and we're judging something that we don't really understand mm -hmm. because everything's more gray than that. And the reality is, is that you meet up against social pushes to try to solve problems, but you'll never solve a problem with one answer. Like, like, so right now what you're, what you're getting the pushback is like, it's like fitness shaming and, and body positivity, exactly. yeah. right? So people are like, oh, well, if we just accept everyone exactly where they are, they'll stop running to these means mm -hmm. to try to gain acceptance. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. But it doesn't work that way because if you just accept everything, it leads to nothing. There's no good outcome that comes from no discipline and understanding consequence and like loving yourself where you're at, but pursuing a better you every day. Sure. Right. Yeah. That's the problem that we're dealing with. So then there's the people who over pursue being a better person because they're trying to abandon and escape how they feel about themselves. And we see that because those are the polar extremes, just like in politics. Yeah. We see the polar extremes and we judge and we say everyone's like that. When the reality is it's much different and it's in the middle. You know what I mean? Dieting can be the greatest thing in the world, but it can also be the worst thing. It's the eye of the beholder, just like ballet was for you. Agreed. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, it's so much insight there. Um, so, yeah, we got down to, what you say, 100 pounds, 100 yeah, pounds. about that. And and so then you you start the ascent. You, mm -hmm. you get you in. You know, I talk about the five stages of change. Mm -hmm. The first one's like identification, and you ID'd it like, oh, I almost I died. Like, okay, I can't. Yeah. And then the awareness of like the next one is it, it, oh, I'm the problem, right? Like coming to terms with like I'm the problem and the solution, mm -hmm. like the awareness part, right? Identification and acceptance. Mm -hmm. So accepting that I'm the problem, I am also the solution. Good news, that means there's a solution. Yeah. If it was cancer, you're not, you know, you're not the problem. Yeah. That's a bit more problematic. You begin to realize yeah. like, oh, maybe it is a good thing I'm the problem because I can change me, mm -hmm. right? That acceptance part. Yeah. And then there's the removal. Mm -hmm. So like you probably had to walk away from ballet. I did. Um, and the friends that were probably also ED-like behavior. Because yeah. usually misery loves company. So you find your little posse of people oh, that go, yeah. ooh, we'll hide food together. For sure. For yeah, sure. right. I mean, I think a big thing when I did go away for my first year of college being on my own, I did isolate myself pretty mm. heavily, but I, I did find like those girls who also were struggling and I thought, oh, this is a good coping mechanism, <laughs> but it, it didn't help yeah. obviously. Um, yeah. But I quickly realized that, you know, I, I went through everything leading up until that point. By that time, it was about three and a half years into struggling with eating and just my thoughts in general. Um, so I've tried like the therapy, the psychiatrist, outpatient, hospitalization, everything, you name it. And I was like, well, nothing's working. So I quickly realized, okay, you have to help yourself. This is on you. So I was ultimately the one to decide to split ties with ballet and I transferred back home. And I, I felt really lost because, you know, that was my identity since three years old. I mean... It sounds crazy, a three-year-old, but I mean, it was my my life and just, I felt like I was giving it up, but now realizing 
I needed to. Yeah, it wasn't happening to you. It was being done for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's really hard to understand that when it's oh, yeah. happening, you know. But that removal process means you're cutting out a piece of you. Yeah. You know, three years old, ballet starts young. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, that's not something you're really starting at 30 if you want to be good at it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you got to stay flexible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 You gotta, you gotta, yeah. I, I do not have that flexibility. <laughs> I'm surprised I can walk up the stairs. Oh, my God. Uh, but, 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 um, but, you know, that's the moment, right? Yeah. We talk, I talk a lot about from pain mm -hmm. to purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're going through what's called the pruning, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a rose is you got to prune them back yeah. and they grow better, yeah. right? And so, but pruning doesn't feel good. I'm sure a plant isn't thrilled it's being pruned Probably not. as it's happening. <laughs> yeah. If it's having thoughts, but <laughs> this isn't great. Yeah. Uh, but then it comes back better and that's part of that process, Yeah. you know? And that's ah, so obvious in your story, but at this moment, mm -hmm. you're at your low, you're going back to your parents, you're losing your identity. Who am I if not ballet? Yeah. Well, I'm a mess up. Mm -hmm. That's what I am. That's exactly right. I'm just like all these other people out here that I semi despise for being failures mm -hmm. upon which I built my whole athletic life on never being a failure and always a winner, pursuing the win. But in this case, I'm actually surrendering to win. Mm -hmm. And it and it doesn't feel like that at the time. No, absolutely not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, okay. So like you're sitting there, you're back home, yeah. right? But, and one more thing mm -hmm. you had to give it up because all the therapy in the world, all of it, if you kept doing the thing that was the trigger point, mm -hmm. none of it was going to work. Yeah. Abstinence had to be there. It did. Or recovery cannot be obtained. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was similar. I mean, we'll get to this, but stepping away from the stage, it was very similar for me for the last, you know, two years I haven't competed and that was needed to regain my passion for the sport of bodybuilding. Cause I, I, I mean, I'll talk about this later, but I started to see these, same these things. same things happening. Let's save that. Yeah. Save it. I will save, save it. it. That's the, yeah, I know that connection to be very obvious yeah. to the listeners yeah. and the watchers. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so check it out. So, cause this is where people are at when they come to coaching, mm -hmm. they're often really lost. Yeah. That's true. They don't know who they are. Nobody finds fitness because things are going great. Yeah, that's true. All right, let's get yeah. 100. Yeah. All right. If you're at home being like, no, my life was perfect. And I just decided, you know what? I want to add a little bit more washboard abs. No, it's very rare that that happened. You were, there was something about you. You felt incomplete about you. You, you felt lost about you were looking for a greater existence. You weren't mm -hmm. sure that there was something more out there for you and you were searching. That means there was a pain, mm -hmm. the pain of change has to be less than the pain of staying the same. So that means staying the same was there was something painful there before people will make a change. That's human psychology. Yeah. So for you to make this adjustment, there had to be something. Maybe it wasn't that big, but for most people, it's big. Yeah, for sure. Like you. Mm -hmm. And then now, so then it's like, okay. So so people come in and they're they're like they're lost and they're looking. They're not quite sure. And they think, well, if I just lose the stomach, maybe that'll be the missing piece. It's part of it, right? Yeah. And then they learn a lifestyle and a process. And this is where some of the good stuff about fitness comes in. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's what you're about to lay on us. Yeah, somewhat, close. somewhat close. It's always a little bit more like yeah. ebb and flow than that. For but, sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, when I transferred back home, I was like, well, all I knew was dance. So I, I didn't even know anything about the gym or fitness or anything like that. So I joined the gym, but all I did was I did cardio and I stretched and I danced in the dance studio. Like I was like, <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do? Like I didn't understand yeah. weights or anything like that. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I eventually met a guy and that's kind of how I got into bodybuilding and just training in general. Um, but throughout that time, when I first moved home, I, like I said, I felt like I lost my identity as a person and I moved in with my best, my childhood friend and we had a little apartment together, but I, I struggled so hard. Like I was around family. I was around friends. I had that support now. Um, but I still struggled with just who I was now, what I was doing. I just felt lost. Um, so finding fitness that quote unquote saved me. And I mean, people say it all the time, like the gym saved me. And I truly think it did. 
Um, although I did struggle, you know, up right. until the age of 25 with this eating disorder. So, I mean, it's been a long time coming. But... Progress is not linear, strict, direct no, linear. Okay. Absolutely so not. you add tools along the way. Yeah. And for me, 100%, the gym gave me something that I could, I could set into my life that was yeah. there for me that mm-hmm. would help me pursue a better me. Mm-hmm. And then it started teaching me discipline. Yeah. And then I, I gained um, a group that I could identify with that supported me, mm-hmm. right? Those, it's like a fellowship, yeah. right? In a way, for many people, this is what I want people to know about fitness. In a way, fitness, you can hate on it all you want. But if you're someone looking for some discipline and to feel better about yourself and start to step out, getting involved in a gym, in a, in a group, uh, you know, even if it's CrossFit, whatever your thing is, even though I have preferences on what you should do, yeah, it's better just to get started. Yeah. Hands down. I don't Great. care. Because you're going to find out things about yourself, what you're capable of. Mm-hmm. Those are amazing things and that everyone in the world should expose them to into fitness instead of looking at the extremes and going, nah, that ain't for me. I'm not about all this muscle and Mm -hmm. all this other stuff. It's like you have to be about that. Yeah. Doesn't have to be about it. You're missing it. Exactly. You're missing it. And that's the gift of fitness that needs to be delivered to the world. 100%. So, all right. So like you just kind of, it was dance, then the boyfriend. And that's like a typical trend. I mean, that like a different ways, cardio, they come from different sports. They find it. Yep. How do you go from figuring, how do you find it, figure out you got a knack for it? What happened? Because clearly something happened. I know. I went to my first show and I was like obsessed with the bikini division. I was like, that's it. Yep. I, I want to look like that. So, I mean, at the time I was, I was smaller. So like it would be possible. Um, but yeah, I, I got into bodybuilding in 2017. So what is that? Like six years ago? Wow. That's crazy. Um, but I found Jason and he started to coach me and I just, I responded very well and I just grew so much passion for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was probably another thing. Like I was in control again and, you know, these tendencies from my eating disorder that I was kind of liking, which is unfortunate to say, but I did just see, okay, this is how I identify now. And this, it brought me joy. Yeah. So I was 100%. like very happy that 100%. I found it. So, yeah. So I, you know, and you know, I, I would argue that in, in now we're changing divisions, but talking about figure yeah. right now, I, I would argue hands down the best shape in the division, in my opinion. And I think a lot of people would agree with me, but you go from again, uh, Producer Keone, go ahead and go ahead and drop the before and after. I, I've never, I mean, I've never seen anything like that uh, in my life. Uh, it's incredible. Now you could say extremes, but but to be delivered from where she was, that's the imp- I think the real important part at first, right? And then and then the, but then that that obsessive part of you to be great, it actually, I mean, it really helped you in this other area and uh-huh. will help you in anything that you want to do in life. But like to make that big of a jump, and you did that in almost like what four years yeah i mean my first show when was that 2017 i i think i did like two regional shows and then i ended up going to nationals that year i placed fifth and then i was already qualified for nationals the next year and that's when i turned pro my second year of competing i went pro and i'm like oh i'm decent yeah i should probably continue so i did i mean and i took two years off before I made my pro debut because I was realistic, unlike some competitors. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized, okay, national level versus pro level mm-hmm. is a completely different ballpark. Yeah. So, you know, I was still working with Jason and we grew and we did the Tampa pro in 2020 and leading up, I mean, 2020, that was COVID era. I know. So obviously my, my prep was a little longer than anticipated. Things were not going as planned. Um, but leading up to that show, I, I felt like that's when I started to put more pressure on myself to mm-hmm. being perfect. Yeah. Um, because I had my following on social media was growing, which was awesome having all that support. But 
people were like, oh, you're going to place top five. You're, you're going to win your pro debut. And Jason would agree. Like my family, they don't know much about bodybuilding, but they would agree. My boyfriend at the time agreed. He was like, yeah, hands down, you're going to kill it. And I went on stage. I ended up placing 16th right. at Tampa. I didn't place. Yeah, and I, and I, I was blown. I didn't understand <laughs> at all. But that's a, another topic for another I, I day. Mean, I'm like, uh, okay. You sure. know, it's your pro debut. I, I was not yeah. expecting to win. Realistically, it would have been cool. It yeah. would have been real nice. But you know, realistically, I was like, okay, I'm a newbie. Right. They don't know me. Yeah. They're like, okay, who's this girl? Yeah. I'm like, all right. For sure. So I was realistic, but getting that feedback of, you know, you're you're too big for this division. You're physique does not fit the standards of figure like I just felt like oh great like another passion is literally just being stripped away from me Mm -hmm. because I was so adamant on staying in the figure division but they said you know women's physique and even Jason he was like you know I think we should try it and I I mean it was hard at first hearing that feedback but then seeing okay maybe I do have potential in it Mm -hmm. and that's when I kind of shifted gears and I started going that route but then that's when I also quickly realized, okay, you're losing yourself. Right. Like I didn't have the passion for it anymore. Yep. Um, I didn't like how I was looking, didn't like how I was feeling. And I just, yeah, yeah. I, my, yeah, it was just bad. That's I didn't feel like myself. Yeah. So, so much. I want to relate this to just anybody, you know, yeah. uh, we see this with people that, again, I get so many clients that come in <clears throat> And they're, they're battling their demons and they're trying to figure out how to get it under control. And then they find fitness and they get a balanced lifestyle, but then they're going to meet those demons again. And they have to be self-aware enough to know where to take it. Some people, a lot of people take fitness too far. Mm-hmm. I agree. Right? They, and, and then that's what we judge the whole thing on. You know, be, because they're not, they're not learning the lessons from the past. Mm-hmm. And so here you are, right? This great talent, this great drive. And you're finding, you're feeling that again. And what I'm like so proud of you for, because when I heard you were deciding to make a pivot, can we announce it here? We're going to make a pivot to wellness, yes, right? Which I think is great. Thank you. Can I just say I love the wellness division? I don't care what any of you think. I love them gorgeous. I love the (laughs) shape. I I just, I love everything about it. I love everything about it. And like when I just went to the Olympia and I got to see it up close and watch the energy in the room, meet a lot of the women. I love it. Mm-hmm. If you don't like me, I don't care. I love it. <laughs> you know, I think bikinis, you know, got its place and I think figure's great. And I think a lot yeah. of it's great, but I just, I think that that's the division I enjoy most now. I agree. You know, in yeah. the female. And so anyway, but you're making that pivot for you because you yeah. noticed that it was becoming another form of the addiction, the, the same addiction, the root of it's the same mm-hmm. and it's creeping up somewhere else. Yeah. And so a lot of times what people are trying to escape coming into getting healthy, mm-hmm. they will meet that issue again. And that's why I don't believe coaches are just physique enhancement. They have to be great guides. And what we're seeing in bodybuilding is a whole lot of physique enhancement and no great coaches guiding their people responsibly, trying to push them to the limit. Things are going to happen. And and that's the sport. That's any sport. You can't blame bodybuilding for that. If that's the case, you get rid of gymnastics, ballet, volleyball, football. Get rid of all of it then if that's what it is. Exactly. Great challenge requires some risk. Mm -hmm. That's the point. It's part of it, yeah. right? But we got a lot of people in this sport not looking out and they're being predatory coaches and 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 they're injuring people mm-hmm. and it mars the whole industry. And that's where I think a lot of us as coaches need to kind of stand up and be the representation of what it is to be a great guy. Mm-hmm. And that's why coaches like you are so awesome because you've survived it. So you understand it. Yeah. So you can be that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of these coaches that have not survived these things, they're not equipped to handle things in an appropriate way and don't have those tools. And and that's why I think that's why I think from pain to purpose Mm -hmm. to prosperity. That's and that's the the title of the hybrid health summit. Yeah, I love that. That embodies what I want the world to do and people like you and and others out there, because really you're the perfect coach because you were certified by the right thing first, which was life. And like how to survive addiction because it's all a grayscale of addiction. I agree. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're overeating, undereating, overtraining, you know, you can't drink alcohol, Netflix, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's going to end up making you gain weight and then yeah. you're going to end up in front of a coach 
And then they're just going to think it's just, oh, I just need to change your meal plan to solve this problem. And I think you and I both know that it's bullshit. It's all up here. It's <laughs> the first, first place that you have to help somebody. Right, yeah. right. And so, you know, but, but again, that same drive is like, you can do anything with that. That's a superpower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Look, you became great at ballet, became one of the best in, 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 in your field, and now you're pivoting. And so I think that they better look out because if you've decided that that's what you want, I, that's where I'm, I'm going to put the pressure on you a little bit. But I, I know okay. the mindset. I, yeah. I know the mindset that goes with that. And you enjoy it. I do. Yeah. I finally regained that passion for training, for bodybuilding. It's just, it feels so nice like, yeah. to be like happy. Right. Going into yeah. it and being a part of your sport again. Yeah. So. 100%. I think people forget you should enjoy what you're doing. Exactly. And if you're not, yeah. you need to reevaluate why you're doing it. Uh -huh. You know? And I think a lot of people with fitness, mm -hmm. nutrition, there I've taken breaks, you know, yeah, and then sure. gain that love back. Yeah. You know, and then sometimes I fall out of love and I'll just do the basics and yeah. then I'm all, I'm back in it all together. And mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. It's a, it's, I, I love that about, I think, fitness in general and sports in general. And I think people should take that advice. You know, they're either all in, they, they abandon it all together. Yeah. And then they're all in, mm -hmm. abandon it all in. It's like, yeah. no, yeah. I think there's, but you can take breaks and you can, you know, get that love back and, yeah. and those kind of things. So mm -hmm. that's a, you're just a shining example of that. Congratulations Thank to you. you. So anybody, I mean, I'm telling you, someone to be inspired by, someone to watch and follow, you know, pivoting in a sport for her health and mm -hmm. for, for her making, putting herself first is something that we should really consider in high regard, uh, for everyone in fitness in the mm -hmm. sport itself. Um, I, I do kind of, I, I, I want to always kind of pick your brain a little bit, yeah. um, with fitness competitions mm -hmm. and then also being a coach. Um, and then also now being a doctor of chiropractic, right? Mm -hmm. How do you use the lessons of your past in your coaching mm -hmm. today? So it, it definitely helps me be a more understanding coach because I understand that, you know, when these things occur in somebody's life, I know how to pinpoint yeah. those, those red flags and I can help coach them quite literally through the process. I can teach them how to better adapt to certain obstacles in their life because, I mean, everybody, they wait to hire a coach for that perfect moment, like the whole I'll start next week kind of thing. I mean, life is never going to be perfect. It's never going to be smooth sailing. So you just have to start. So having that coach that will be willing to communicate and help you through those obstacles is huge. And I think my past definitely helps me with that. And that's something that I, I loved about working with Jason is that I felt comfortable enough sharing that information with him, my struggles. And I felt okay taking a break from coaching with him and he was understanding of that. So definitely having that coach who is understanding is huge. Um, also pushes you, but also has the wherewithal to know yeah. the balance. Yeah, they know when to push, they know when to pull back. And I think that is essential. I think too many people, it's like that whole, the black and white thing. Like, nothing. Yeah. yep, all or nothing approach. And that's not going to get you very far. If anything, it's going to get you like 10 steps behind. Yeah. So I think that's definitely helped me, my past experiences with that for sure. You know, one of my biggest things that I, I'm because I'm trying to inspire a lot of people that are inspired by your story mm -hmm. to get out into the coaching space or yeah. if they're a health practitioner of any kind to expand their services yeah. or whatever, get them to take the next step in their life. <clears throat> You know, when I hear all the things that you have now, I mean, the, the bodybuilding gave you a lot of tools. The nutrition education got you a lot of tools. Mm -hmm. The chiropractic gave you a lot of tools. But when I hear you, I'll be honest with you, what makes you the most relevant and effective coach when it, when when I'm listening to you mm -hmm. is the recovery from your past. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? I agree. Yeah. So the craziest thing is, is that all the things that you've added could never stack up to the thing that you were forced to go through mm -hmm. that at the time you would have never wished on anyone, but now is your greatest asset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I want people at home to realize this. There's something that you have been through. There is something that you've survived and, and that should be celebrated. Survival is an amazing yes. thing. But once you survived it, then what? Right? Because a lot of people come into fitness, they lose the weight and then they go back out there and they don't, they don't do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? 90% of them gain all the way back, right? Yeah. And right back. 
because it, my my belief is is that once you've survived something that you have to stay involved in it mm -hmm. in some way mm -hmm. or you have to give it back to someone else or you can't keep it yeah and i think that's probably why you're drawn to being a coach too a little bit right yeah definitely i mean i think it's it's huge being able to be an impact to not only my clients i mean definitely but just social media in general i mean we know social media it's it's a huge highlight reel yeah. but being vulnerable and sharing my transformation i mean i did take a break from sharing it so often i was like okay i don't want that to just be my identity but then i was like why not mm -hmm. like i need to be proud of this because like you said it's something that's truly molded me into the coach into the the woman that i am today and it it could definitely help somebody yeah 100 percent. so again if you, you know if you've survived something that's your first you've been certified by life yes. if you've ever thought about getting into coaching or helping people maybe in the mental space maybe in the nutrition space maybe again uh relationship space i don't care spiritual space i don't give a shit what it is, if you've survived it, you need to take that and turn that into purpose. Yes. And you can. That's the main certification that all you need. You don't need anyone else's permission. You've already got something now and then you can take that and just keep walking forward with it. Mm -hmm. And exactly, I mean, uh, and, and Megan is a shining example of that. So take the next step in your life and if you've survived something and, uh, and you've, you've overcome something, uh, you need to give it away. Oftentimes you are bound to repeat it. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts? Well, I think we'll end it on that. Was uh, that was a that was a good enough statement? I think to close it on. Oh man, um, what would you what would you say to people that are in fitness right now that are struggling with ED and being silent? Mm, that's a good one. Um, one that you know you don't have to look a certain way on the outside to in order to get help. I think people think that you have to look sick to reach out for help, especially with eating disorders. Um, and that's just simply not the case. Everybody is deserving of help and getting that help that they deserve. Um, but also know when it's not right to reach to your coach for the help, you know, because I, I see it, I saw it a few years back more often coaches kind of marketing towards people with eating disorders or like you'll see like the binge eating support groups and stuff pop up on social media. And I just think that's so wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not qualified health professionals yeah. and you do need that Yeah. because this is, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a mental health disorder. This is not to be taken lightly. Yeah. So these people need the help that they deserve. And if you're a coach and you're seeing that your client is struggling or starting to struggle with disordered eating, sure, offer them guidance, but also point them in the right direction. direction. Make those connections. Yeah. A nutrition dynamic, we have a whole list of resources. I love that, yeah. Right? <clears throat> that we've made relationships with mm -hmm. because we understand that maybe we can't be uh, the solution, but yeah. we can have an answer. Yes. Right? Yeah. And I think that's the important part. And coaches will tell you that, oh, I'm not seeing it in my client base. No, you're not looking. Yeah. You're exactly. not looking because it's rampant. Yeah, right? it is. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. You're not looking. You're putting your head in the sand, and then you're saying, "Hey, I'm not. I'm not responsible." Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you're not responsible for the condition, but being a coach, you put yourself in a position, right? That that you have a indemnity, right, to look out for your clients and have resources when you yes. come across this problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm gonna have a re if I'm gonna have a playground in my backyard and kids on it, I better have a first aid kit, right? Oh, I didn't let the kid fall. Well, no, but you had a reset. You have a backyard that you have yeah. a playground that people can get injured. So you should have the tools. Yeah. If I'm a coach, people can get injured. They can fall into conditions. So I just need to be aware of the right resources to send them to the right place. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it right? does. Um, so I think, I think, like I said, I think coaching, if it keeps going the way uh, of people like Megan and others, I think we're looking for a bright future. Um, Megan, where can they check you out? Yeah, so, well, I just changed my Instagram handle, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's dr.meg underscore Scooby Prep. That is my Instagram. I do have my little chiropractic page. I need to start posting on there a little more, <laughs> but that's my main one. Yeah. Uh, you can always shoot me an email if you're interested in coaching, uh, megan at scoobyprep.com. 
And I would love to just help anybody I can, really. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you're very brave. Thank you. And you killed yeah. it. She was nervous. No, no reason I to be nervous. nervous. <laughs> All right, check us out again. We will see you very soon. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.